Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebraic topology. Today in other duality, in algebraic topology, there are plenty of dualities in algebraic topology. Uh, Poincaré duality is the most famous one, but this one is also pretty cool. It's called Alexander duality. And the reason why I like it so much is, well, it's about Horn spheres. We will see it. So Alexander's Horn sphere was developed um, during the process of trying to figure out this Alexander duality. And it gives you actually a proof of the Jordan curve theorem. Um, and that's not trivial. So it's, the proof is non-trivial, obviously, because we are talking about a pretty big machinery here. Um, but still, this gives you a proof, a rigorous proof of the Jordan curve theorem. So let me just jump in with Alexander's original question. Um, so Alexander's thought about something like this. You have a sphere. So here's my S2. And it sits in R3. And obviously, the sphere will divide uh, R3, so the standard sphere will divide R3 in an inside uh, and an outside. And what does this mean? Well, this just means um, that, well, this space here has two connected components, two connected components. And the point is this should be true. And this kind of the conjecture, this is obviously true for the standard sphere, but this should be true for any type of embedding of the sphere into R3 even crazy type of embed embeddings that we can't even imagine, or at least I can't, because they're just super, super crazy and, and beyond my imagination. So here's one of them, one of those funny embeddings, uh, the so-called Alexander's Horn sphere. I will show you a Mathematica demonstration in a second. It's linked in the description. But it's kind of a really, really strange embedding of the sphere. So this is the sphere, the gray part here. It's actually an embedding of the sphere, S2, into R3. And it's really, really crazy. And it's absolutely less, it's not clear at all, you will see the construction in a second, whether they should actually really divide um, R3 into an inside and an outside, so in two connected components. So let's have a look at the um, inductive construction of this sphere. So here's Mathematica linked in the description, of course. And there are some parameters that I won't touch. You can do that, play around yourself. But basically, here's the setup. So here's my sphere. And yeah, and obviously it's, this is a standard sphere, so it obviously divides my R3, which is a background, into an inside that you can't see because it's inside of the sphere, and then outside this is this white thing here and the outside. And then you it well inductively construct a horn sphere by growing horns, and this is how it works. So you um, you grow horns, you move them out a little bit. This already looks like a horn, but before you touch them, right before the horns touch. You want to add a handle, but shortly before the handle touches, um, you pull up new handles. So let me zoom in a little bit. So here, shortly before the handle touches, you pull out new handles at each handle. So at each step, um, so you start with two of them, then each one of them gets another two, and then each one of them will get another two. So this grows exponentially, so it gets a lot of handles. And you just keep on going. So you put them closer and closer, and sh shortly before they touch, you, as you can see, you grow more handles, right? Uh, as you can see here, and then you go on, you pull them closer and closer, and shortly before they touch, as you can see here, you grow even more handles, right? So here are more handles. And you keep on going. Uh, shortly before they touch, you keep on growing more handles and more handles and more handles. And the limit of this is a funny embedding of the sphere into uh, R3. And for this type of embedding and others that I can't even imagine, as I said, because they're just way beyond me, it's less clear why there should be an interior and an exterior, an inside and an outside. Already for this picture, I have, I have no feeling. I really have no feeling at all. So how can we prove this statement? Um, I'm not even sure whether I should believe it's true, but it is true. So let's think about how we can actually prove this theorem. And it uses homology. It's kind of a nice argument in homology. So it works as follows. So Alexander then first thought the following. First of all, we can get rid of R3. We can put everything into S3. S3 is a little bit nicer. It's compact. And it is really just this idea of the stereographical projection um, that's upstairs here. So if you take your plane, you can add a point at infinity if you want, and you just wrap it up into an S2. So you can wrap up an R R2 into an S2 by adding a, a point at infinity or you can go the other way around by kind of a stereographical projection. It kind of depends a bit of what you want to do. They're kind of the same object. One of them has one more point if you want. And the same works in any dimension. So you can replace um, R3 with S3 by kind of a stereographical projection. 
And the kind of the point is now we can we can measure the number of connected components. That's what we want. The, the number of connected components of this piece, that's kind of what we're interested in right now. As I said, we just replaced R3 with S3, so that's no big deal. But the number of components is uh, counted by the dimension of the homology, of the zeros homology. So what we want to know is the zeros homology of this space. And turns out that the right formulation uses reduced homology, uh, which is then just saying that the reduced homology is of dimension one. Why? Because homology should count connected components, so it should be of dimension two. Uh, so if you get rid of one because you take the reduced homology, it should be of, of dimension one. So the statement would follow if we could prove this, this theorem that the reduced homology of this space is uh, of dimension one. So what all you need to do in some sense, all you need to do is to compute a homology of the space. And only the zero homology is really of interest here. But you can get it, you get you get even more general statements. So Alexander duality is exactly then the statement that for every subset of S to the N with some nice properties, you get this funny duality on um, on homology or cohomology. It's an ice homology of S N without K. So K is our um, is our uh, uh, embedding of S N minus one in this case is isomorphic to the corresponding homology n minus i minus one of k. And the funny thing is it's now of k and not of a crazy space like s without k anymore. It's k, very simple space k. In particular, in our example, the very simple space k is, of course, then just uh, this real self. Right? So this, this is kind of a funny, funny statement. This only depends on the interesting pro interesting, uh, intrinsic properties of k and not on the embedding. Right, so here you kind of have the embedding, and here you don't have it anymore because it's just k. You don't see the parent space. It's kind of fun. So we get this um, in our example that I was this, this most crucial example of the um, um, Jordan curve theorem. If you want the higher version of the Jordan curve theorem, is this isomorphism, and here comes our good old friend. So h n minus one of s n minus one. We know that by now this is z. So this is really of dimension one uh, over q. Right? Right, so thus we get the dimension of this reduced homology is actually really one. This you can generalize this a little bit; it doesn't really matter. But um, it's kind of a beautiful idea, right? So instead of looking at S n without k, which could be pretty crazy as a space because it might depend on k, you go to cohomology. You have some duality involved. So that's why it's called Alexander duality, and it actually only then depends on the space k itself. So you get rid of the dependence of the embedding, which is pretty good. And then of course you're done because then it's just the standard sphere anyway, right? So in, in our example here, um, crazy embedding doesn't matter because homology in the end only sees the standard sphere and you just put it over uh, through the duality. Um, slight catch, you lose the property of the embedding. So for example, this is not strong enough to detect, to detect knots. So here are two knots. One of them is called the trefoil, one is called the unmod. So if you want to build them from rope, you just take a rope and you glue the ends together. Apparently someone has done that. So here the ends are glued together um, using some kind of tape. And what you get is a knot. And the knot could be trivial or not. So the trefoil is not trivial. Um, um, so if you would like to draw it, so it goes under, over, under, over, under and over, so it alternates always, and it's, it's kind of non-trivial. And of course, the unknot. So here you can maybe see it already. So this rope, this goes under, and this goes under here. So I can just pull out this loop, and then it just untangles. So a classical question in knot theory and topology would be, can you distinguish those? They are also, if you want just funny embeddings of the sphere, just think of this rope as a rope, right? It's, it's a little bit thickened, so they're actually funny embeddings of the sphere. So it's really this rope picture. And sadly, you can't distinguish them because Alexander duality tells you, um, so this is a torus, this is an embedded torus, the rope is a torus. So Alexander duality just tells you that it doesn't depend on the um, embedding, it just depends on the intrinsic properties of the space. So you can't distinguish them. So slight catch here in Alexander duality, um, but sometimes you only want it to depend on the intrinsic properties and then you can prove something like um, the separation statement this is called um, the Jordan Brower separation theorem in, in honor of uh, Jordan, which is kind of the generation of the Jordan uh, curve theorem, and of course of Brower. Um, anyway, 
Um, so this video was all about the Alexander duality, which is kind of the second most important duality that you will see in, in homology. And it's kind of this funny observation that if you have a space, and the space is nice, like F3, you can generalize, as I said, whatever, and you take out the subspace, then in homology, that turns out to be kind of, again, this duality kind of type of thing. Instead of counting from bottom to top, you count from top to bottom. Uh, so it goes on the other side of, of, of so it goes from cohomology to from homology to cohomology. Kind of loses the property of S without S three without or S n without. Um, so it just uh, sees the intrinsic property of the space K in my example from before. And then you can of course compute it, and then you can compute the homology of spaces which are a little bit crazier, like F three without uh, taking out a certain crazy embedding of the sphere, then proving something like the Jordan curve theorem. So I think that's pretty cool. It's kind of the shortest proof of something like this Roland curve theorem that I actually know and already use this in quite a lot of machinery of algebraic topology. In any case, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.